All right, welcome back. I believe you all had your lunch and uh, as decided, let's get started with uh, risk return and portfolio theory. Basically, you can put the title as portfolio management. Now, uh, this title, many students ask me, sir, why don't you directly refer this as a portfolio management? Why are you putting it as risk return and portfolio theory? See, I have an important explanation for this. Objectives of an investor is linked with risk and return. Portfolio theory is the means through which you achieve your objective. Let me explain it in little detail. Investment objectives, if you see, first is maximization of returns. Second will be minimization of risk. If you invest in stock market, you have high returns, but you have a negative aspect over there that is high risk. If you invest in bond market, you will be having definitely low risk, but there is a disadvantage that you will have low returns as well. So, do not you find that if you invest in stock market, you are able to get high returns, that means you are able to maximize the returns, but you are compromising with the risk over there because of high risk. Your objective one side is to minimize the risk, another side your objective is to maximize the returns. So obviously there is a conflict in your objectives. Now investing in bond market is giving you low risk, low returns. So low risk as an advantage, low returns is a disadvantage. So there are conflicts in your objective how to deal with this situation. So, the idea is very simple. You are not going to pick bond market basically. So, under portfolio theory, you are definitely going to learn about portfolio of bonds also, but that is a very small line. The major stream of learning is creating portfolio of stocks. Basically, why? You invest in bond market, you will never be able to get high returns. But you invest in stock market, you will be getting high returns. What is the problem in stock market? That there is high risk as well. So we blend a lot of risk management techniques to manage the risk, to bring down the risk in spite of earning high returns. Investing in a single security will not let you fulfill your objectives. So you create an investment portfolio. So, there is a need for an investment portfolio. I repeat, there is a need for investment portfolio. So, please do one thing. Please uh, write up this content. This is something really, really important. I would want you to write it.
all right i'm sure you have written this please uh, try to follow what i'm saying see in case of an individual security you will be never achieving your investment objectives single security is not your objective so investing in stock market is the fundamental requirement because you will get high returns problem was what there is a high risk involved you can manage the risk by diversification so creating a portfolio doesn't mean that you create a portfolio of similar type of stocks for example if i am talking about pharmaceutical companies if i create a portfolio only of pharmaceutical companies then the risk cannot be minimized risk can be minimized by diversification that is when you invest in different sectors so creating a portfolio of diversified investment is your typical objective through which you will ultimately achieve your main investment objectives that will be maximization of returns and minimization of risk so what happens the whole study of portfolio theory that is about investment portfolio should be divided into two categories analysis of risk and returns with respect to a single security and then in the second phase you will be dealing with portfolio management when i talk about analysis of risk and returns it is about single security so let us talk about risk and returns of the single security so i'm talking about the first part of this chapter that is backdrop for managing the portfolio in this part we are not dealing with portfolio concepts we are dealing with single security portfolio will be a cluster of securities right it will be a group of securities you know managed together within the portfolio here i am talking about single security so you will learn about risk and returns of a single security then you will apply that concept in portfolio theory so that will be the second phase of this chapter so first part that is backdrop for managing portfolio dealing with single security now in the earlier session we have talked about the determining rate of return for an individual security which represents an equity investment i'm sure you remember this formula which was the base model formula d1 and p1 in this formula are the future cash flows ke is the expected rate of return and p0 is nothing but the present value of these future cash flows this is how we arrive at p0 value so absolutely nothing new for you we have learned this already i don't want to spend time behind this concept number 2 i have divided the whole chapter into concepts various concepts and each concept numbered over here so second concept was relating to average rate of return on a single security what happens using this approach let me take you back using this approach you will be able to compute the rate of return for each individual security you know how to apply this if p0 is d1 plus p1 divided by 1 plus k ke will be obtained from this equation as d1 plus p1 divided by p0 and from the whole thing subtract 1 so you can compute ke as return for each year but then each year's return may not be constant it is not a bond where you are investing your money it's a stock where you are investing your money returns every year can change returns may even go to negative so the linking concept is the next one that is average rate of return on single security when the information is available about past individual rate of return of a security over past few years the average rate of return will be determined by simple arithmetic mean first of all you have different kinds of means right arithmetic mean geometric mean harmonic mean we always apply arithmetic mean then we have simple mean and weighted mean it is very important for a student to understand where to apply simple mean where to apply weighted mean so be careful about this and how do you compute simple arithmetic mean summation of x divided by n so all the observations that you have sum up the values of all divided by number of observations that is what you get let us apply this in a question over here 
that will be question number 3. Suppose we have this kind of information. Determine the average rate of return based on the following data. They have given year end 1, 2, 3, 4. Dividend for each year, share price for each year. And then at the last line they have given. At the end of year 1, the price of the share is rupees 200. Now, how will you solve this question? Simple thing is, for year 1. Mind it, when I say year 1, it is end of year 1. Huh? When I say year 1, it is end of year 1. Dividend for that year is 20. So, I will consider this as D1. Share price at end of year 1 is 220. I will consider this as P1. And price at the beginning of the year 1 is 200. So, I will consider this as P0. So, D1 plus P1 divided by P0. From the whole thing you subtract 1. You will be getting the return for the first year. Likewise, you compute the return for second year. So, for second year, I will consider this as D1. This as P1. But for the second year, do not consider this as P0. Price that was expected to prevail by end of first year will become the price at the beginning of second year. So, for the second year, this is D1, this is P1 and this will be P0. Likewise, for the third year, this will be D1, this will be P1, this will be P0. For the fourth year, this will be D1, this will be P1, this will be P0. You compute for each year the KE which represents the rate of return for the shareholder and for 4 years you will be getting 4 different rates of returns. Once you get 4 different rates of returns, take the simple average and your task is done. So, you use this formula KE equals to D1 plus P1 divided by P0 minus 1. Define the variables and as I have explained you, work out the KE calculation for each year. Easily you can do that and at the end the average rate of return will be the simple arithmetic mean because there are 4 observations, 4 years, 20, 25, 28, 27 add up all divided by 4. So, arithmetic mean will be x bar that is equal to summation of x divided by n and that will give you the average rate of return as 25 percent. So, carefully observe what we have done. Once you are clear with this, we move ahead. Alright, if you are clear with this, time for us to move ahead and now we talk about expected rate of return on a single security in a probability series where x bar will be computed as summation of x into p. So, here what is x value? x value is the return for each possible situation and p stands for probability of that scenario. For example, we have various economic conditions like good, average or bad and we have probabilities assigned for each of these economic conditions. Then the returns which are expected from each condition multiplied by their respective probabilities that will be x into p and take summation of x into p. That summation of x into p will give you your expected rate of return. Now, here when you are using probabilities, probabilities become weights probabilities become weights and this average what you are finding over here is not a simple average it is a weighted average see what is the fundamental requirement over here because i find lot of students making this error when they are handling big big questions in portfolio that they are still not clear with when to apply simple average and when to apply weighted average so do one thing let me explain this by an example and in the follow up question, I will explain you with difference where would you apply simple average and where would you apply weighted average. Now, rate of return and probabilities are given. So, how do you apply the average rate of return? Rate of return will be considered as x, probability will be considered as p and what you do? You take x into p. So, 
15 percent probability is 0 0.2, 18 percent probability is 0 0.3. So, each return you multiply to their respective probabilities the product x into p when you take the summation of that summation of x into p will give you 19.4 in this example and that is the value of x bar that is the average rate of return based on these probabilities. I would want you to quickly note down this example before I take you ahead. Now, I am sure you would have written this example. One thing I am emphasizing on one point when to use simple average, when to use weighted average. If your concept is not clear at the early stage, you will get trapped badly at later stage. So, let me take you to a little more comprehensive example where I will show you when to take simple average, when to take weighted average. Question number 4, if I put it on display over here, it says the rate of returns in the past 20 years have been observed as follows. Each year individual rates of returns have been given. What anyone would do? Take the calculator, take the average. To take the average what you would do? Add up all the returns. And there are 20 observations, right? There were past 20 years for which the returns have been plotted. So you would add up all the returns divided by 20 to get the average return. Simplest task, easy task. That is which average? That is obviously simple arithmetic mean. If I have to compute this, I add 16 plus 15, sorry, 16 plus 18 plus 15 plus 16 plus 15 plus 16 plus 21 plus 18 plus 15 plus 12 plus 16 plus 12 plus 18 plus 21 plus 15 plus 16 plus 18 plus 21 plus 21 plus 18. I have added 20 years returns and when I add it up what I am getting on my calculator is summation of x that summation of x is 338 and there were 20 observations. So, 338 divided by 20, the result is 16.9 percent. There is absolutely no trouble with this. So, I am not emphasizing on this calculation. What I want you to understand is the question asked you something different. Let me take you back to the questions requirement. Look at this. The first part in the question says, Determine average rate of return over past 20 years. The answer you have already obtained 16.9 percent. How will you apply probabilities for determining the expected rate of return? This is a question. How to answer this part? Look at one thing. If I further take you back to the basic data given in the question. 
observe this data once again and see what you find 16 percent 18 15 again 16 15 again 16 21 18 15 12 again 16 don't you see that on a recurring basis more than once you are finding 16 percent repeating in a frequency likewise again 15 percent is appearing multiple number of times statistically there is a frequency distribution table something called frequency if you count how many times 16 appeared how many times 15 appeared how many times 12 appeared how many times 18 appeared in fact if you observe this data very well what do you see the lowest rate of return is 12 percent over here the highest rate of return is 21 percent over here correct how many times 12 is appearing how many times the next rate of return what i find from this data it is 15 percent because there is no 13 no 14 after 12 the next big count what i find is 15 then next one i find is 16 then i find is 18 and last one what i find is 21 so i find only five different rates of returns 12 15 16 18 and 21 and the number of observations what we have over here are not five observations there are 20 observations so guys when you have five values but 20 observations it is guaranteed that certain values are getting repeated and that is where frequency will play its role let me show you some calculations over here this we have understood right x bar equals to summation of x divided by n alternatively if i make a table i identify returns and their frequencies there are only five types of returns as i said how many times each of these returns appear the frequency of appearance 12 percent two times 15 percent four times 16 percent five times 18 percent five times 21 percent four times these are returns and these are their frequencies now if i give you this data instead of that big data if i give you this data logically you are not going to add up these values and divide it by 5 because the number of observations were not 5 number of observations were 20 there were 20 observations and 5 different values if you add up 12 15 16 18 21 and divide it by 5 you make a mess you go wrong because 12 appeared twice so it is 12 should be added two times 15 appeared four times so 15 should be added four times that is why we should multiply these frequencies to these returns so these returns are therefore mentioned as x frequencies are mentioned as f in this column you are going to take f into x when you do that the total of f into x the summation of fx will be 338 which is matching with the summation of those 20 observations and summation of f is basically the total number of observations the total number of frequency if you divide 338 by 20 obviously you will again get 16.9 percent so x bar equals to summation of fx divided by summation of f x bar equals to 16.9 percent this 16.9 percent this 16.9 percent both are the same things but you know what this calculation represents simple arithmetic mean this calculation represents weighted arithmetic mean here there were 20 observations for 20 values you took simple mean you added up all the observations and simply divided by number of observations here there were only five values but spread over 20 observations you had applied weighted average this is weighted average this is simple average both are resembling the same thing but the approach of computation is different now observe one more thing 
what is the role of probabilities in portfolio management fantastic role and you need to understand probabilities which you are observing from the past data becomes the expectation for the future see what has happened in the past only that will be your expectation for future if suppose i ask you to invest your money into this particular stock and i tell you you know you will be getting 35% returns you observe the data in past 20 years never the return has gone beyond 21% and now i am telling you that i am expecting 35% returns you will not believe you will not have trust on that expectation you will find that something is dicey over here because your observed average is just 16.9% this is what you have been observing past 20 years suddenly the stock is not going to give you 35% it may i am not saying it will never but the chances will be very less so what we observe in the past becomes expectation for the future look at one thing out of 20 observations twice it was 12% 2 out of 20 gives you indication that the probability will be 2 by 20 2 by 20 means 0.1 4 out of 20 it was 15% 4 times out of 20 times it was 15% so the probability for that will be 4 by 20 that is 0.2 so you have 20% chance that you get 15% returns 20% chance means the probability 0.2 So you get returns of fifteen percent with a chance of zero point two as probability. Then sixteen percent, five by twenty, zero point two five, twenty five percent chance that you may get sixteen percent returns. If you plot probabilities from these given information, look at this. I just explained you this point. What is happening? Five times out of twenty, the rate of return was sixteen percent. So, what is the probability that the rate of return shall be sixteen percent? Five by twenty, or simply zero point two five. If we use that probability to identify the rate of return, what we will do? We will plot returns as x, probabilities as p. So, returns will be same five returns. Probability is what we observe for twelve percent. It was two times out of twenty. So. Two times out of twenty will make it zero point one as probability. Then fifteen percent, four times out of twenty will make it zero point two. Sixteen percent, five times out of twenty, zero point two five. Eighteen percent, five times out of twenty, again zero point two five. Twenty one percent, four times out of twenty, that would again make it zero point two as probability. So identify the frequency and based on that you determine the probabilities. then take x into p as we have seen in that earlier example and x into p values once you get take the total of that summation of x into p will be the weighted average rate of return or simply the average rate of return here we are using probabilities as weights in the earlier table we have used frequencies as weights so you understand one simple thing probabilities are extracted basically from the past observation and this is how probabilities are extracted if you know the ground of calculation your understanding further will become better and much clearer so just do one thing there's no need to write down the whole calculation but you please try to identify make a comparison between this table and the earlier one look at this table here it was frequency that was becoming the weights and in the next table that we have just seen it was probability that was considered as weights both ways you are computing the weighted average compare and see you are actually doing the same thing earlier what we did we multiplied each of these returns with their frequencies and frequency total was 20 so that summation of fx which came to 338 we divided by 20 here each frequency each frequency got divided by 20 which becomes probability so probability total will never be 20 right probability total will always be 1 so that dividing by 20 that task is already done you just multiply the returns with their respective weights where the aggregate of weight is 
summation of x into p will directly give you the average rate of return that you were trying to compute. Fine, moving forward from here, because this is all about analyzing risk and returns, by far we were talking about measuring the returns, let us now talk about measurement of risk. See, measuring risk is very very important and when you talk about measuring risk in case of portfolio, there are various measures of risk variance, standard deviation, coefficient of variation, covariance, beta, various measures of risk we have. We can classify these risk measures into two categories, measurement of absolute risk and measurement of relative risk, two types of risk, absolute risk and relative risk. What is absolute risk? When you observe standalone security and when you observe what is its return pattern, how much is the deviation in its return, you will be able to gauge the risk through the deviation. So, the simple objective is the wider the fluctuation in the returns, the more will be the risk, right? In other words, higher the deviation, the higher will be the risk lower the deviation, lower will be the risk. No deviation means no risk. Deviation is the basic cause of risk. Imagine there are certain types of securities like investment in government bonds, investing in money market. Money market means you go to a bank, put your money in fixed deposit. You consider that as risk free investment because at the maturity date, you will be getting the exact defined promised amount there are no chances of any variation in that because it is not subject to market risk, correct? Certain investments are subject to market risk, certain investments are free from market risk. Those investments are termed as risk free investments. If you invest your money in risk free investments, what is the factor that is making it risk free? Consistency of returns, there is no fluctuation in returns, no deviation in returns that makes your investment risk free. So, the idea is what? What is making your investment risky? The fluctuation in the returns. In other words, the deviation in the returns is making it risky. So, the base of measurement of risk, when we talk about absolute risk, the base of measurement is deviation. So, variance and standard deviation typically focus on measuring the absolute risk. You should know one thing very well. Variance is nothing but the squared form of standard deviation. In other words, standard deviation is the square root of variance. So, observe this. The deviation in the returns can be considered as a basic cause of risk. The absolute risk of any security is measured by standard deviation of its returns. The absolute risk of any security can also be measured by variance of its returns. Standard deviation or variance are indicators of total risk or absolute risk. Now, what is the interrelationship between standard deviation and variance? You can see this symbol over here, standard deviation goes with this symbol sigma and variance is symbolized as sigma squared. In other words, variance is nothing but the squared value of standard deviation and standard deviation is nothing but the square root of the variance. Both are indicators of absolute risk, where you are taking the risk of that security on a standalone basis, you are not looking into any other factors. Now, moving forward. How to compute standard deviation? in a simple individual series that is concept number four. Let us try to understand something out of this. Let us take an example of question number five. Now what is given over here? The following rates of returns have been observed on stock X over past eight years. They have given rate of return for each of the past eight years. 
determine the standard deviation of returns on stock x now this is a very simple calculation for anyone who knows how to determine standard deviation very simple but the logical way of determining standard deviation should be clear to you look at this we have past 8 years and we have individual rate of return for each of these years we will first find out the average rate of return so we will sum up all these returns and divide it by 8 years we will be getting the average so let us find that average rate of return first so we are plotting the returns for each of these 8 years this was the basic data given in the question and when I take the total of returns the summation of x is coming to 128 and because there are 8 observations the simple arithmetic mean x bar equals to summation of x divided by n and that will be 128 divided by 8 and that will be 16 percent. Now what happens this is the mean and each year the returns are not matching with the mean right sometimes the returns are greater than the mean sometimes the returns are lower than the mean so you have deviation towards the positive side or you may have deviation towards the negative side so to find the deviation from the mean so i am using the term deviations from the mean mean is x bar and these are x values so deviations will be symbolized as x minus x bar when you find x minus x bar so it will be 20 minus 16 19 minus 16 17 minus 16 12 minus 16 16 minus 16 17 minus 16 9 minus 16 and 18 minus 16 when you do that you will be able to plot all these deviations look at one thing sometimes the deviations are positive and sometimes the deviations are negative we want to find on an average how much is the deviation right we want to find on an average how much is the deviation the point is to find average deviation when you try to sum up all the deviations it is coming to zero check it will be zero the summation of deviation will always be zero why because positive deviations and negative deviations will offset each other you will never be able to find the average deviation by taking the aggregate of deviations and dividing by 8 observations you cannot do that now what is to be done to negate the effect of this positive negative offset here we take squaring of deviations so instead of finding the average of deviations we would first take d square value so this is deviation symbolized as d x minus x bar so d square will be the squared value of deviation so for each of these deviations if i take the square what is the advantage of taking square positive number or negative number when you take the square of that number the square value will always be positive so when i take the total of d square the summation of d square i am getting 96 right 96 is the sum of squares of deviations correct it is sum of squares of deviations if you divide it by 8 observation you will be getting average of squared value of deviation we wanted average deviation but first what you will get is the average of squared value of deviation and that is what we call as variance so look at the next calculation over here variance of returns will be summation of d square divided by n so 96 divided by 8 will give you 12 12 is the variance now what is the logical meaning of this variance it is the average of squared value of deviation because it is the average of squared value of deviation we wanted the average deviation overall this is a squared form to bring it back to the root form we will take square root of this number so square root of the variance will be the standard deviation so square root of 12 that is 3.4641 percent will be your answer as standard deviation now guys this calculation of standard deviation is something very very important and you should be able to understand this without any difficulty standard deviation 
is going to be a base calculation for all other calculations ahead in this topic portfolio management. So, I am sure you have understood how to compute standard deviation and uh, time for us to move ahead. How would you compute standard deviation in a probability series? Variance of returns that is sigma squared in a probability series will be summation of d square into p. Once you get the variance, the square root of the variance will be the standard deviation. Then you can simply arrive at standard deviation without any difficulty. So, let us try to solve a question to understand this whole concept. Let us go to question number 6. It says the expected returns on stock x are given as below. They have given rate of return along with the probabilities. Determine the standard deviation of returns from the above given data. So, how would you identify the standard deviation over here? First of all, this is a probability series. So, be careful you will not compute the average returns by adding up all these and dividing by 4. Probabilities are given. Probabilities indicate a weighted series where the average must be the weighted average. So, first of all, the returns will be multiplied to their respective probabilities to find the average rate of return. Once you find the average rate of return, what you will do next? You will find the deviation of returns and then you take squared value of deviation then squared value of deviation will be multiplied to the respective probability. So, d square multiplied by probabilities would give you d square into p. Summation of that will give you the variance and square root of variance will ultimately give you standard deviation. So, let me show you how to make the calculations over here. Look at this. We are taking rate of return and their respective probabilities. Rate of return I will symbolize as x probabilities I will symbolize as p. So, x into p is going to give me the average returns. So, x into p values summation of x into p 19.4 percent that is the average returns 19.4 percent. Once I get average returns I move forward and I take x and p these were the basic inputs given in the question returns along with their probabilities. Now, I find deviations that is x minus x bar and when I find deviations some places I get negative deviations, some places I get positive deviations. I know one thing that positive negative offset will happen. So, I take d squared values, d squared values once you get because this is a probability series d squared values you will have to multiply to their respective probabilities and d square into p would give you the variance. So, summation of d square into p that is coming as 10.84 will be considered as variance of returns that is 10.84 and the standard deviation of returns will be the square root of variance. So, square root of 10.84 will give you 3.2924. Do not forget to mention it as a percentage because originally the returns were informed to you as percentage. So, standard deviation of returns will also be given in percentage form. So, take a couple of minutes note down this entire calculation and then I take you ahead.
all right friends time for us to move ahead once you have understood how to compute standard deviation in a probability series let us move ahead and we talk about concept number 7 that is coefficient of variation now standard deviation and variance were the measures of absolute risk coefficient of variation is a measure of relative risk it measures risk for each percentage of return that you may earn so it's a measure of relative risk it relates risk of a stock in relation to the returns of the same stock and it is measured by taking standard deviation divided by expected rate of return so sigma x divided by x bar it measures risk in terms of each percentage of return so let me give you an example to make you understand this point very well look at this point stock x has an average return of 20% with standard deviation of 6% means this stock gives you 6% risk by offering 20% returns correct so you have 20% returns and 6% risk so by taking 6% risk you will earn 20% return that is what is appearing from this in other words to earn each percentage of return i repeat to earn each percentage of return how much risk you would take that is computed in the name of coefficient of variation that is cv of x will be sigma x divided by x bar and that will be 6% risk divided by 20% returns so 6 by 20 will give you 0.3 how would you interpret cv that is coefficient of variation can be interpreted as stock x has risk of 0.3 for each percent of its return if it has risk of 0.3 for each percent of return so you can understand to earn every 1% of return 0.3% is your risk that is because for earning 20% returns overall there was 6% risk overall so how much risk you are taking for every 1% of return that is measured by this relative risk measure cv that is coefficient of variation uh now let me take you directly to the next concept concept number 8 this is the heart of the portfolio chapter i'll tell you one thing thousands of students who do not understand what is covariance and what is correlation they keep solving questions without even knowing what they are doing so i ask lot of students you know what is covariance this is sir we don't know what is covariance but we know how to determine it when i ask students do you know what is correlation some students are very clear with the meaning of correlation and how it is computed so the problem area is not what is correlation problem area is what is covariance and let me warn one thing covariance is a different measure coefficient of variation is a different measure some time back we have just talked about coefficient of variation that is different covariance is something different see it takes certain bit of time for someone to understand what is coefficient of variation and how is it different from covariance and it is not coefficient of variation that carries that high degree of importance in this chapter it is this concept covariance which carries high degree of importance throughout this chapter this concept you are going to apply now what is correlation when statistically one variable is rising another variable also rises we say that they have positive correlation because they would move in one direction if one variable rises and another variable declines we call that as a case of negative correlation because they would move in opposite direction that is the meaning of correlation so if your stock x 
has a positive correlation with another stock of yours that is y if x and y have positive correlation if x is giving you high returns y will also give you high returns if x gives you low returns y will also give you low returns if they have negative correlation situations where x gives you high returns y would give you low returns and vice versa correlation plays a substantial role in designing a portfolio because we would want to aim at diversification because we want to aim at diversification diversification can be achieved not by creating a portfolio of stocks having positive correlation we can achieve that by creating portfolio of stocks having negative correlation so what is correlation i explained you covariance is a product of three factors if i want to find covariance between x and y it will be standard deviation of x into standard deviation of y into correlation between x and y but what is the real meaning of covariance i'll be able to explain you the significance of covariance when we come to the second part of this chapter that is portfolio management but as of now if i try to tell you what exactly is covariance and what is its role to play see covariance will show the degree by which your portfolio risk gets impacted by combining two stocks in a portfolio i repeat what will be the effect of combination of two stocks over your portfolio risk that will be measured by covariance if the covariance is positive it will add something more to your portfolio risk if covariance is negative it will reduce your portfolio risk and point is very clear if correlation is positive covariance will be positive if correlation is negative covariance will be negative so let us do one thing let us uh, identify some important issues over here correlation is a statistical measure that indicates the extent to which two or more variables fluctuate together a positive correlation indicates the extent to which those variables increase or decrease in parallel a negative correlation indicates the extent to which one variable increases as the other decreases moving forward covariance is a measure of how change in one variable are associated with the change in a second variable covariance between x and y indicates the impact of combination of the two stocks over portfolio risk covariance between x and y is a product of three factors number 1 standard deviation of x number 2 standard deviation of y number 3 correlation between x and y most important line in this whole slide is this line the meaning of covariance covariance between x and y indicates the impact of combination of the two stocks over the portfolio risk and how do you assess the covariance it is the product of these three factors sigma x multiplied by sigma y multiplied by correlation between x and y moving forward covariance between two stocks x and y in a simple individual series can be determined by taking summation of dx into dy divided by n where covariance indicates the covariance between the returns of x and y deviation of x that is dx is x minus x bar dy is y minus y bar and n is the number of observations or you can simply say in a simple individual series it is number of years so covariance is a product of three factors that is sigma x into sigma y into correlation between x and y so through this equation if you would want to find the value of correlation correlation between x and y will be covariance of xy divided by sigma x into sigma y this entire content i would want you to write it down and then only i take you ahead please note it down quickly and then we move ahead
all right friends if you have completed writing all what i have shown over here time for me to take you ahead and let us solve some questions which are very important questions question number 9 over here says consider the following data about returns of two stocks x and y see friends if you really would want to master your command over portfolio topic questions that i am asking you to consider as important you solve those questions along with me and later on when i am taking you through complex questions your understanding will get better and better if your base is clear look at one thing there are two stocks x and y and they have given you returns for past 5 years you are required to determine the following average rate of return of both the stocks you know how to find it it is simply summation of all these divided by 5 years for x and y so for x the average return will be x bar for y it will be y bar you can easily compute without any difficulty then standard deviation of returns for both stocks now you have learned how to compute standard deviation also it is only this third part which is little different for you and how to do that i am going to guide you over here mind it the process of calculation is similar in individual series and probability series but there will be certain differences in the calculations and that is where you need to identify how to deal with an individual series and how to deal with a probability series so let us do the initial part of the calculation here we take year x and y year 1 2 3 4 5 we plot the returns for x we plot the returns for y we will take the aggregate of x aggregate of y and then after this table what we will do is compute x bar and y bar so x bar will be 99 divided by 5 y bar will be 80 divided by 5 through this once we get x bar and y bar we fill up the remaining part of the table and how to do that that also i'll explain you first what you will do is you'll plot a table like this then you compute x bar and y bar so below the table you separately compute x bar as summation of x divided by n and that will be 99 divided by 5 19.8% y bar will be summation of y divided by n that will be 80 divided by 5 that will be 16% once you get these calculations you come back and you start plotting other calculations like dx which is x minus x bar then once you get dx values you plot dy that is y minus y bar you get dy values then for computing the variance and standard deviation of x you will have to take squared value of this dx column you'll have to take squared value of dy column for computing the variance of y so we are taking squared value of dx likewise we will be taking squared value of dy and for computing the covariance between x and y you see one simple thing variance of x will require you to take squared of dx value so dx into dx variance of y will be dy into dy covariance between x and y will be dx into dy so the last column for computing the covariance dx into dy you take dx into dy and you will be able to plot all these calculations summation of dx into dy will give you the base for computing covariance uh, what i want you to do i want you to note down these calculations as i told you earlier we will not have time to write all the possible calculation but this is the base for everything that you are going to learn ahead and here i don't want any kind of mess so please uh, note down the solution for this question as well as the next one so i'll just give you some time note down quickly and then i take you ahead
all right friends i am sure you have completed writing these calculations and uh, time for me to take you ahead the variance of returns sigma x square will be summation of dx square divided by n that in this case will be 192.8 divided by 5 that gives you 38.56 similarly you will be computing variance of y and that is 6.8 standard deviation will be square root of these respective variance values 6.2097 percent for x and uh, 2.6077 percent for y again i am giving you a minute's time to quickly take note of these calculations. completed once you have completed the variance and standard deviation calculations time for me to take you ahead covariance between x and y it will be summation of dx into dy divided by n 80 divided by 5 that is 16 correlation between x and y will be covariance of xy divided by sigma x into sigma y carefully note this calculation see i did not write the standard deviation values over here because when you apply square root and whatever you get we were rounding it off right if you take those rounded off values you will never be able to get the proper calculation so instead what you should do in the denominator over here you first multiply 38.56 with 6.8 when you do that you get 262.208 so the calculation will go as 16 divided by square root of 262.208 then you take square root of 262.208 and you get 16.1928 so 16 divided by 16.1928 would give you correlation between x and y as 0 0.9881 so note down this calculation as well and that will be end of this solution.
all right friends i'm sure you have completed this whole thing time for us to move ahead if it is a probability series how would you determine covariance of returns of two stocks the simple logic is deviation of x should be multiplied to deviation of y but you will also simultaneously multiply the probabilities so covariance of xy will be summation of dx into dy into probabilities so summation of dx into dy into probabilities is what you have to do that's all that is all about the computation of covariance between the returns of two stocks in a probability series so you may quickly take note of this line that in a probability series cov xy will be summation of dx into dy into p where p stands for probabilities moving forward concept number 9 determining correlation between returns of a particular stock and market now here before you proceed with anything further let me explain when i say correlation between the stock and the market this is something really really important you know you keep hearing news about stock markets today market has gone up today market has fallen down today market has declined by 2% today market has declined by certain points when you hear this news and you have invested in that stock market your stock or your stock portfolio may not resemble as the market but it is part of that market so if there is a decline in the market whether your stock or whether your stock portfolio is also declining or not that depends on correlation between your stock or your portfolio and the market your stock has to be compared with that of market that is what we call as correlation between your stock and market and where there is correlation there will be covariance so you will have to compute the covariance of your stock with the market you will have to compute correlation of your stock with the market the idea is same what you applied in earlier calculation when you computed the covariance of stock x in respect of stock y now you are going to compute covariance of stock x in reflect to or in reference to the market index so market index will also have movement upward and downward it will also have fluctuations we would want to identify with the fluctuation in the market what is the degree of change in your particular stock and that completely depends upon the correlation between your stock and the market likewise the covariance of your stock with the market so let us uh, note down some things in this heading to measure covariance in a simple individual series look at this thing it is now this time summation of dx into dm dm indicates the deviation of market returns divided by n so you know computing covariance between x and y and computing covariance between x and market the approach is exactly similar but definitely here you are not relating a stock with another stock you are relating a stock with complete stock market index in a probability series it will be summation of dx into dm into probabilities computing correlation between x and market it is simply covariance of x and market divided by standard deviation of x into standard deviation of market so the computation is exactly done in the same manner no difference at all now connecting to this is the next concept that is concept number 10 beta what is beta see beta is yet another measure of risk it is yet another measure of relative risk so you will always compare risk of your stock in relation to the market and you mention degree of beta anything as less than 1 equal to 1 or greater than 1 if beta is exactly 1 
it indicates that your stock and market have exactly same parity in terms of risk in other words your stock is as risky as market is if beta of your stock is less than 1 it indicates that its relative risk is lower than that of market if beta of your stock is greater than 1 it indicates that the relative risk in your stock is greater than market for example if your stock has beta of 1.2 times 1.2 times means the risk of your stock is 1.2 times of the market risk if i say risk of your stock is 1.2 times of the market risk means your stock is riskier than market 1.2 times means the degree of risk is 20 percent more than what is prevailing in the market your stock in simple words will be considered riskier compared to the market so beta is a relative risk measure it measures and indicates risk of a particular stock in relation with the market for example if beta of stock a is 1.2 times it is understood that risk of stock a is 1.2 times of the risk prevailing in the market now how do you compute beta let us talk about this use your simple common sense standard deviation of x is 12 percent standard deviation of market is 6 percent look at these standard deviations with this information given to you <coughs> you would find that risk involved in your stock is twice that of market now how do i get to know it is twice that of market use simple common sense market standard deviation is six percent your stock standard deviation is twelve percent it is clear that your stock is having double the market risk so it is understood that risk of stock x is two times of the risk prevailing in market how do we get that two times that beta is computed by taking 12 as the numerator and 6 as the denominator so 12 by 6 will give you two times that two times is indicated by sigma x by sigma m the point is beta is a relative risk measure you cannot just take the ratio of the standard deviation relative risk measure means you want to plot one thing that if the market has gone up by say 3 percent your stock has a beta of two times means it should go up by two times of three percent means it should go up by six percent if market has declined by two percent your stock would decline by two times of two percent that is four percent but you know what you are doing while you are concluding like this that two times you are applying to the changes in the market to identify that would be the change in your stock but this cannot be done unless your stock has a positive correlation with the market but then your stock may have zero correlation your stock may have negative correlation in other words without considering correlation this ratio will have no relevance that is why what we do is it cannot be measured that is beta cannot be measured without taking into account the correlation between the returns of stock x and market so we multiply correlation of x m over here and we get a formula for beta that is beta of x will be sigma x by sigma m into correlation between x and m but this logic once you capture and you identify that this is the formula for computing beta i'll show you one more variation over here correlation between x and m we have learned already it is covariance between x m divided by sigma x into sigma m and beta of x what we just learned was sigma x by sigma m into correlation between xm if i substitute correlation of xm as covariance of xm divided by sigma x into sigma m what will i get the beta value beta value will be sigma x by sigma m into correlation of xm in place of correlation of xm i am taking covariance of xm divided by sigma x into sigma m the moment i substitute this value here there is sigma x in the numerator multiplied by another ratio where the sigma x is appearing in the denominator sigma x sigma x will get cancelled out and what you will get as a product over here in the numerator it will be covariance of xm and in the denominator it will be sigma m into sigma m that is sigma m squared that is variance of the market now we have another alternative formula for computing beta and we call that as calculation of beta by covariance method and it is this formula so when you have to compute beta you can compute beta by any method 
either by taking the correlation method that is sigma x by sigma m into correlation between xm or you can take the covariance method where it is covariance of xm divided by variance of the market either way you can compute beta it will give you the same result quickly take note of this calculation and then i take you ahead All right, friends, let us move ahead and let us talk about concept number 11 that is capital asset pricing model. Here we have an equation that is ERX equals to RF plus RM minus RF into beta of X. When you consider this whole equation, you would find that each term used in this equation, each variable used in this equation has a specific meaning. ERX itself is the expected rate of return on security X as per CAPM. RF indicates the risk free rate. RM indicates the return on market portfolio. Beta of X is the beta factor for security X. The whole logic behind this entire equation I will be explaining you through a calculative example that we are going to cover up in the next question and let me explain it over there question number 11 it reads like this risk free rate is 7 percent rate of return in market is 15 percent average rate of return on security x is 17.69 percent per annum beta of security x is 1.2 times you are required to analyze the situation using capital asset pricing model and determine the alpha for security X. Decide whether it is worth investing in security X. Guys, do one thing. Don't write anything in your notebooks. Just try analyzing this situation and see if you can make some calculation. I promise you, I will not ask you any question. But you make some calculations at your end. I give you a couple of minutes and then see whether you could get the calculations that were actually to be done.
all right so tell me if you could figure out something from this all right i promised you that i won't ask you any questions i keep up my promise let me tell you what was supposed to be done over here see the rate of return that is prevailing in the market is 15 percent when i say market means it is stock market so you invest in stock market where your investment is in market index for example national stock exchange in india its index is called nifty nifty is the market index if you create a portfolio exactly in the same way that is the composition of nifty then your portfolio becomes replica of nifty if nifty is earning 15 percent you will also earn in your portfolio as 15 percent but that is taking risk right it is amounting to taking that much of risk which is prevailing in the market if you take that much risk you will earn 15 percent return if you invest in risk free securities there will be absolutely no risk but then you will have to earn only 7 percent so if you do not want to take risk you end up earning 7 percent if you are ready to take risk you will earn 15 percent so now how much is the extra return that you are earning because of taking risk that is extra risk will give you extra return correct no so 7 percent is your return without risk 15 percent is your return by taking that much risk which is prevailing in the market so if you are taking that extra risk how much extra return you are getting the answer is 15 minus 7 that is 8 percent this 8 percent is called risk premium it is the award for taking risk but beta of your security is 1.2 times if beta of your security is 1.2 times i would say your stock is more risky compared to market if your stock is more risky compared to market your stock should be able to get more advantage then only it is justified to take more risk if your stock is 1.2 times riskier compared to market it should be fetching you 1.2 times of that excess return that is 1.2 times of 8 now how much is 1.2 times of 8 it will be 9.6 so the return that you should expect on your stock will be 7 percent of risk free rate anyway on top of that 9.6 percent as excess return for taking little higher risk that will be your expected rate of return from your stock so do one thing observe what i am showing over here the explanation for what i just talked about rate of return in the market is 15 percent risk free rate is 7 percent risk premium will be 8 percent an investor who is ready to invest in the market would expect 15 percent per annum returns that is 7 percent as risk free rate and 8 percent as premium for taking risk prevailing in the market security x has beta of 1.2 that means the risk associated with security x is 20 percent more than risk prevailing in the market therefore the investor will definitely expect a higher reward for such high risk that is by expecting 20 percent more premium therefore the expected risk premium should be 8 plus 20 percent that is 9.6 percent so if it is 9.6 percent as the risk premium your expected rate of return will be 9.6 percent added to the risk free rate of 7 percent it will give you 16.6 percent now i am sure all of you would have got that 16.6 percent when you attempted the calculation now in exam you do not have to write all these details if you are attempting the calculations in exam you just have to write the formula for CAPM that is ERX equals to RF plus RM minus RF into beta when you apply these calculations 
you know 15 minus 7 that is rm minus rf that is 8 8 into 1.2 will give you 9.6 that 9.6 added to 7 gives you 16.6 percent i have explained you the entire logic behind this capm equation and i have also explained you how to apply the calculation in exam now after understanding all this i want you to put your focus on one more aspect one more aspect read the question once again it has given you that the rate of return that was observed on your security x it was given as 17.69 percent i'll show you the calculation once again i'll take you to the question again look at this question average rate of return on security x is 17.69 percent per annum now considering this and coming back to this point you are expecting or rather i should say you should expect 16.6 percent return but how much is the past historical return of this stock the historical return of this stock is not 16.6 percent it is higher than that it is giving you 17.69 percent how much excess return you are getting if you check 16.6 percent is what you expect as per capm but you are going to get more than that because the past observation of the stock is indicating that the stock has potential even beyond 16.6 percent its potential to generate return is 17.69 percent how much is the further surplus return that you are getting over here if you calculate it will be 1.09 that 1.09 surplus is what we call as alpha so the rate of return on an average observed on security x is higher than the expected rate of return based on capital asset pricing model therefore it is advisable to invest into such security now coming to talk about alpha alpha of security x is the difference between average rate of return on security x and expected rate of return on security x as per capm so the equation for alpha goes this way rx is the past observed rate of return that is the past average rate of return and erx is basically the expected rate of return as per capm and alpha comes to 1.09 and it's a positive value so we would say alpha of security x is positive indicating that there is a possibility of getting a rate of return higher than expected as per capital asset pricing model therefore it is worth investing in security x so what indication do we get from alpha if alpha is positive it indicates that you will be finding your stocks potential greater than what you expect then you should buy such stock is al if alpha is negative then the potential of your stock to generate the returns is even lower than what you expect then you should not buy such stock you should in fact sell the stock if alpha is zero it indicates that you can stay invested into that stock no problem with that because whatever rate of return you are expecting the stock also has the potential of giving the same rate of return so if we talk about alpha of a security it is computed as rx minus erx this erx is computed as per capm and rx is the observed rate of return from that stock so if alpha is positive you should buy the stock if alpha is negative you should sell the stock if alpha is zero you just hold the stock i want you to write these concluding lines quickly and then i take you ahead
all right friends uh, i am sure you have completed writing these lines so time for us to move ahead and now we will talk about the next concept that is concept number 19 that is portfolio returns return on portfolio is the weighted average returns of individual securities included in the portfolio the weights are the proportion of money invested in each security or the market value of such securities at a particular date so the idea is very clear what is the idea behind computing portfolio returns so assume that your stock is comprising of or your portfolio is comprising of three stocks a b and c stock a stock b stock c each will give you some returns the portfolio return will be the weighted average of returns of these individual securities and what will be the weights over here weights will be the proportion of money invested in each stock for example i had invested rupees 1 lakh over three stocks a b and c i have invested 30000 on stock a 30000 on stock b 40000 on stock c so what is the proportion of money invested in each of these 30% on stock a 30% on stock b 40% on stock c so 30% 30% 40% or 0 0.3 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 these will be the weights of or the proportion of money invested in each stock which becomes the weights applying these weights on their respective returns you will be computing the average return for the entire portfolio so in other words the portfolio returns would indicate the weighted average return for each individual security included in the portfolio so let us take examples to understand this examples given in question number 19 let us identify this it says calculate return on portfolio based on given information so you have security a b c d e five stocks value today value today means p0 expected dividend after year one that means d1 this is expected value after year one means this is p1 so d1 plus p1 divided by p0 minus 1 would give you what the return for each individual security then how much will be the weight of each of these look at the value of stock a today value of stock a today is 2 lakhs what is the total value you add 2 plus 3 plus 1 plus 5 is what 2 plus 3 plus 1 plus 5 6 plus 5 11 plus 2 13 total money invested in these 5 stocks is 13 lakhs out of which 2 lakhs you have invested in stock a so the weight of stock a will be 2 by 13 weight of stock b will be 3 by 13 weight of stock c will be 1 by 13 weight of stock d will be 5 by 13 and weight of stock e will be 2 by 13 now if you have all these as weights and you can compute the returns then apply the weighted average of these returns and that weighted average of that return will be the portfolio returns and then we will be showing the reconciliation because the question is asking also determine the expected rate of return for each security and reconcile the rate of return on portfolio that reconciliation how it is to be done let us carefully observe so first thing what we do is we calculate the returns by using the formula k equals to d1 plus p1 divided by p0 minus 1 we compute for security a b c d and e for a we got 60 percent for b we got 15 percent for c we are getting 50 percent for d we are getting 20 percent for e we are getting 10 percent once you get ke for each of these individual securities then the time is to apply the weighted average how would you apply the weighted average now portfolio returns is basically the weighted average of returns now this equation what i have written over here please try to understand this equation rp indicates return on portfolio it is ra into wa ra indicates the return on stock a which we already computed weight of a wa is the weight of a weight of a as i told you is the proportion of money that you have invested in a 
and how did we compute that proportion of money if you can recollect on stock A let me again take you back to the question let me take you back to the question look at this how much money you have invested in stock A 2 lakhs your total value of your portfolio today uh, we totaled up some time back it was what 13 lakhs so 2 lakhs divided by 13 lakhs or simply 2 by 13 becomes the weight of A 3 by 13 becomes weight of B 1 by 13 becomes weight of C so we take the base of proportion of money invested the proportion of money invested becomes the weight keep in mind one thing the aggregate of weights must be 1 aggregate of weight must be 1 so you get the returns from this information so recheck again you computed returns of A and B then you computed returns of C D and E this is very simple task you have learnt it already then you are going to apply the weighted average returns so now see 60 percent was the return on A its weight was 2 by 13 15 percent was the return on B its weight was 3 by 13 50 percent was return on C its weight was 1 by 13 20 percent was return on D its weight was 5 by 13 and 10 percent was return on E its weight was 2 by 13 when you take this weighted average what you get is 25.769 percent I want you all to do one thing I want you to write this line about the calculation I I would rather say the concept of portfolio returns and show just this calculation other things you can do on your own how we have done this calculation that is important and I am going to show you one important thing over here how would you reconcile this whole thing through the entire portfolio so do one thing quickly take note of these calculations and this line about concept of portfolio returns and then I take you ahead. All right, friends, I am sure you would have completed writing this whole thing. 
now look at one thing <clears throat> the average rate of return for the entire portfolio which we are calling as portfolio returns you should be able to match it up with the overall portfolio otherwise if this is not matching with that rate of return means somewhere your calculation would have gone wrong this is the computed weighted average of individual returns first we computed individual returns then we computed their weights then we took the weighted average of their returns and now we are declaring that 25.769 percent is the weighted average returns or that is basically the portfolio returns now let me do one thing let me again take you back to the question and make you calculate something good look at this information in the question and pick your calculator i will also do the calculation along with you let us do that calculation along with me you also do the calculation let us pick this as d1 because this is d1 for stock a b c but how much dividend overall i would expect from the entire portfolio let us find that so it is uh, 20,000 plus 45,000 plus 15,000 plus 0 plus 40,000. It is coming as 1,20,000. The total of this column, 1,20,000. Keep it aside. What will be the expected value of the entire portfolio after one year? Expected value of entire portfolio after one year, 3 lakhs plus again 3 lakhs plus 1 lakh 35,000 plus 6 lakhs plus 1 lakh 80,000 it is coming to 15 lakh 15,000 so this total I will call as P1 for the entire portfolio this total which was 1 lakh 20,000 I will call as D1 for the entire portfolio so D1 for the entire portfolio was 1,20,000. P1 for the entire portfolio is coming as 15,15,000. Correct? So please add 1,20,000. D1 for the entire portfolio 1,20,000 plus 15,15,000. triple zero. That is D1 plus P1 for the entire portfolio. What I am getting is 16,35,000 d1 plus p1 for the entire portfolio this value today column if you total up it was 13 lakhs that is p0 for the entire portfolio let us divide d1 plus p1 by p0 so i'm dividing it by 13 lakhs and when i do that i get 1.25769 subtract 1 and i get 0 0.25769 it is nothing but Multiply by 100, you get 25.769% matching exactly with the weighted average that we have computed. So, let us do this reconciliation work. 25.769% what we got here as the answer could be reconciled with the return on portfolio. So, we got this 25.769% finally. KE for the entire portfolio will be d1 plus p1 divided by p0 minus 1 so 1 lakh 20000 plus 15 lakh 15000 divided by 13 lakhs from the whole thing when you subtract 1 you get exactly 25.769% quickly write up this calculation as well and then i take you ahead
all right friends i am sure you have completed this calculation as well time for us to move ahead next concept is the concept of portfolio risk so concept number 20 absolute risk of the portfolio now as you know the absolute risk is always computed by taking standard deviation or the variance now here we have Markowitz model that comes into picture as in how to determine the absolute risk of the entire portfolio and particularly a portfolio comprising of two stocks x and y so the absolute risk or the total risk of the portfolio can be measured by portfolio variance which we are symbolizing as sigma p squared or standard deviation of the portfolio that is sigma p the standard deviation of the portfolio is the square root of the portfolio variance and determining portfolio variance using modern portfolio theory developed by Markowitz. Now, Markowitz developed modern portfolio theory and that is why Markowitz model which is mathematically proven model is always to be applied when you are computing the portfolio risk. So, please write the heading absolute risk of portfolio and uh, under that you just write the Markowitz model of computing portfolio risk with respect to two stocks x and y is given below. So, you know two stocks x and y this is the equation that you have to apply. Now, if you try to catch this logically you will be able to understand this very clearly you know the expanded form of a plus b the whole square is a square plus b square plus 2ab right so sigma x into wx you consider as if it is a sigma y into wy you consider as if it is b this term is a square this term is b square this term is 2ab so, 2 into sigma x into sigma y into w x into w y. In other words, 2 a b means 2 sigma x w x into sigma y into w y. But wherever you are multiplying the deviation of x with deviation of y, whenever you are multiplying or dividing deviation of one with the other, you are trying to relate the risk of one stock with the other which is not possible without incorporating the correlation between them. The correlation between x and y will always come whenever you are multiplying standard division of x with standard division of y. My point is try to logically always understand this equation. So, uh, if I give you a simplified version, a simplified version just give me a moment, I will try to simplify this for you in order to give you much clear understanding just a moment uh, just a moment okay i'll do one thing see this Let us assume that there is a perfect positive correlation between x and y. Okay, let us assume that there is a perfect positive correlation between x and y. Just for a while you try to assume that there is perfect positive correlation between x and y. Now what happens? Your stock portfolio is comprising of two stocks x and y. How do you compute the portfolio standard deviation? This is the formula given by Markowitz. Earlier I showed you the sigma p squared value that is portfolio variance this is portfolio standard deviation look at one thing now because correlation between x and y is perfect positive i am substituting that for one correct because i am assuming correlation between x and y is perfect positive i am substituting that for one and now look at this whole term what i am getting sigma x square into w x square one term 
second term is sigma y square into w y square second term third term is two times sigma x into sigma y into w x into w y multiplying by one does not change the term into one will let the term remain as it is. Now I am asking you to consider sigma x into w x as a sigma y into w y as b. So sigma x into w x is a. So sigma x square into w x square will be nothing but a square. Sigma y into w y is b. So sigma y square into w y square will be b square and 2 sigma x w x means 2 a into sigma y into w y sigma y into w y is b. So, do not you find that you get it in the form of a square plus b square plus 2 a b. If it is a square plus b square plus 2 a b, I repeat if it is a square plus b square plus 2 a b, what you will get? It is the expanded form of a plus b the whole square right. So, in the next line I am writing sigma p equals to a plus b the whole square a value is sigma x into w x b value is sigma y into w y a plus b the whole square. So, a plus b the whole square and square root of that it gets nullified and what you get is sigma p as sigma x into w x plus sigma y into w y. In simple words when the correlation is perfect positive you know sigma x is the standard deviation of x sigma y is the standard deviation of y sigma x into sigma y will give you the multiplication of deviation of the two stocks and there incorporating the correlation between them is important. That is where this term includes correlation. Anyway, what I am trying to explain is sigma x into w x and sigma y into w y you are trying to compute the weighted average of the two standard deviations right. Sigma x and sigma y are the individual standard deviations of x and y. You compute their weighted average and it will give you sigma p value that is the portfolio standard deviation can simply be the weighted average of standard deviation of the two stocks. But this cannot happen in all the cases this can happen only when there is a perfect positive correlation. So, what would happen if there is no perfect positive correlation. So, let us try to go back let us try to go back. So, this is the form of equation. So, if it is sigma p squared if it is sigma p squared I would write sigma x into w x plus sigma y into w y the whole square that means it is a plus b the whole square I will get to arrive at a square plus b square plus 2 a b. So, a square plus b square plus 2 a b that 2 a b term is basically 2 into sigma x into w x into sigma y into w y 2 a b in that last term sigma x is getting multiplied to sigma y. When you are multiplying deviation of one stock with the deviation of another stock do not forget standard deviation is always a positive value. We do not ever consider a negative value, but mind it when we computed standard deviation it was the square root of the variance correct and square root of the variance when you arrived at standard deviation the correlation between x and y could be positive, negative, zero, anything. So, without incorporating correlation the multiplication of standard deviation of x and standard deviation of y is meaningless. That is why we must apply correlation also over here. Basically when correlation is 1 you multiply 1 you do not multiply 1 does not matter, but in this equation this 1 is important to indicate that there was a perfect positive correlation. In this whole term when you incorporate correlation let me now take you back to where we started look at this whole thing. The formula comes as sigma p squared equals to sigma x square into w x square plus sigma y square into w y square plus 2 times sigma x into sigma y into w x into w y into correlation between x and y. This is a square term this is b square term this is 2 a b term. One more thing I would say sigma x into sigma y into correlation between x and y itself becomes covariance of x y. So, another way will be sigma x square into w x square first term plus sigma y square into w y square as second term and two times covariance of x y into w x into w y. This whole thing can be computed for portfolio variance 
and square root of portfolio variance will give you portfolio standard deviation. So what we do is we will take calculative examples to have better understanding over here. So you may at least write this one line equation quickly under the head Markowitz model. Don't write the whole thing. It will be just unnecessary repetition. Just write this one line. It will be enough. Quickly write this one line and I take you ahead. You must have written this line, right? The portfolio variance. Now, let me take you to a calculative example for you to have better understanding over here. Just a moment. Question number 20 in your book. Straight simple question. Consider the following data with respect to two stocks X and Y. They have given you Sigma X as 8%, Sigma Y as 5%, WX as 0 0.6, WY as 0 0.4. You should never forget what is the significance of WX and WY. WX indicates the proportion of money that you have invested in stock X. WY indicates the proportion of money that you have invested in stock Y. 60% of your money is invested in X, 40% of your money is invested in Y. And 0 0.62 is given as correlation between X and Y. You are required to determine the portfolio standard deviation. Very simple task. First check one thing. Correlation between X and Y is a positive correlation, but not perfect positive correlation. If it was perfect positive correlation, you know, I would have simply computed the standard deviation of portfolio by taking the weighted average of these two standard deviations. That's all. If this was perfect positive correlation, I would have simply taken sigma x 8 into w x 0 0.6. So, 8 into 0 0.6, 8 into 0 0.6 would give me what? 4.8 and 5 into 0 0.4 would give me 2. 2 plus 4.8 answer would have been straight away 6.8 task done. But here correlation is not 1, correlation is 0 0.62. So, you will have to go with the complete expanded form and how would you do that? Sigma x square into w x square. So, it will be 8 square into 0 0.6 square plus 5 square into 0 0.4 square. That is two terms completed. Last term will be 2 times sigma x into w x. So, 2 into 8 into 0 0.6 into 5 into 0 0.4 and do not forget to multiply at the end 0 0.62. When you are showing the solution over here, what you would do? You write up that expanded form of sigma p squared calculation, sigma x square into w x square plus sigma y square into w y square plus 2 times sigma x into sigma y into w x into w y into correlation between x and y. Apply all these values and you will be able to get sigma p squared as 38.944. So, sigma p will be nothing but the square root of the same and what you get is 6.2405 percent, 6.2405 percent. Now, let me tell you what we have done by far. This is the basic level of portfolio topic. In your institute study material, the questions that are given are of even little advanced level. So, I would want you all to do one thing. After understanding all this, you go through your institute study material. You identify what all questions you are able to do 
yourself what all questions are troubling you if you find any particular question that you are not able to crack not able to understand or anything that is troubling you you would simply message me and you can write the particular comment in the comment section the question number or the illustration number you mention and i would do one thing the last session that i am going to take for you will be the coverage of questions from your institutes material because if i keep on discussing 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 there is no end to this this is a quite big topic i would recommend you all to work a little on your own about this whole thing i have given you a good background you will have to see what all you are able to do and what you are not able to do and uh, i have told you very clearly that if you have any specific requirement you may put forward that requirement as which topic you want me to cover so please understand based on request given by some students after the first session got over uh, though i did not plan but i got lot of request of covering capital budgeting topic capital budgeting topic again at cma final level is quite extensive again just like portfolio you can divide capital budgeting into two segments the basic level and the advanced level so uh, basic level capital budgeting let me be very honest i don't want to cover up that in the live sessions because these are revisionary classes in fact i have given more than 20 videos on basic part of capital budgeting already in the channel in my youtube channel what you can do is you can search for a playlist on capital budgeting videos i assure you one thing before this day ends so by tonight i'll be creating a separate playlist purely for capital budgeting required at cma final level the basic part i would want you to go through that entire capital budgeting video set and look into after covering that which are the areas which are troubling you i will keep one session specifically for discussing capital budgeting questions which are troubling you one session for portfolio questions which are troubling you now that i will do on the last day tomorrow i'll have two sessions both of those sessions i am just going to do one thing i am going to pick the topic risk management in derivative market where derivative analysis and valuation will be my focus point i'll try to cover as much as possible in derivatives all possible varieties of derivatives i'll try to cover tomorrow's class you cannot expect to write anything you be ready to listen and understand the whole matter and uh, tomorrow's class again we will divide in two sessions first session morning 10 to 1 second session will be from 2 to 5 tomorrow's task is only to cover derivatives and next day as i told you one session we will be keeping for advanced questions on capital budgeting one session for advanced questions on portfolio but before i do that i want you all to definitely 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 cover up the questions from capital budgeting and portfolio from your institute material and uh, if there is anything other than that specifically if you want me to cover you can mention in the comment section of this video and uh, with this i'll be putting an end to this particular session i will be definitely reading your comments and looking into what you want me to cover specifically if there is any problem area so next session which we are planning that will be derivatives and that will happen tomorrow morning from 10 to 1 the first session and 2 pm to 5 pm second session yes i understand lot of students have commented me about uh, covering 
uh, the capital budgeting part i will definitely do it but as i said you should go through the entire playlist on basic part of capital budgeting and then i take you to the advanced level of capital budgeting that will be on 8th june morning session if these sessions are falling short i may put one extra session also for your advantage i don't mind doing that but you do as i am instructing you don't forget to watch the playlist which i will create today on capital budgeting specifically for cma final level with this i'll be putting an end to this session